Okay, class, in today's session, we're going to learn about paced rhythms. So when we're talking about paced rhythms, it can be an external pacemaker that goes on the outside of the body. It can be a transvenous pacer where you put a wire into the heart and actually attach it to a temporary pacing box, or you can have a permanent pacemaker inserted. As to why we would need a pacemaker, usually the reason a pacemaker would get inserted um, is if a patient is bradycardic for some reason and they're symptomatic with it. So if you have a person who's symptomatic um, with their bradycardia, they have the slow rhythm and they're dizzy, they're lightheaded, they're having chest pain, we learned we can give atropine for it or we could do a dopamine drip, but we can't continue to have atropine. If this is something that they're constantly needing medication, they keep going into this bradycardia, we're always going to try to find and treat the cause if possible, but if we can't, then we need to think of a permanent solution. So a pacemaker may be another um, possibility. Six sinus syndrome is where the um, pacing capability of the heart, the sinus node is just kind of getting, a lot of times we see this with elder patients, um, it's getting, the heart's getting weakened, uh, the, the conduction system is kind of going intermittently in and out. Um, heart blocks, we learned about our second degree and our third degree heart blocks last week. And if the person is in these heart blocks and we can't fix the cause right away, the person may end up needing a pacemaker. Another indication for it might be a chronic atrial fib patient that has a slow ventricular response. A lot of times patients that are in AFib, we give them all this medication to keep their rate controlled, but then their rate actually goes too low to make them to where they feel good, to where they feel healthier, that they have enough energy. So sometimes they actually, we're giving them medication to control their AFib, and then when they end up needing a pacemaker just to give them enough um, cardiac output. So the different types of pacemakers we might see is one is an external pacemaker. So this goes on the outside of the body. These electrodes, um, these patches here are gonna go on the chest just like they would if we had to defibrillate someone. You can put one right under the right collarbone and one over towards um, under the left breast area. Now, a front approach like that, doing it where, it cross, where the electricity crosses the heart, like when we defibrillate, it will work for an external pacemaker, but sometimes it's tolerated a little bit better if you do a front back approach, an anterior posterior po approach, where you put one over the front of the heart and then you roll them over and one on the back side on the back side of the heart, where the current would just go straight through them. Then what happens on these external pacemakers, your defibrillators, is they have a pacing button. And when you turn the pacing button on, the rate will usually come up at 60 beats per minute. And some of the doctors will have you start at 70, but 60, 70 beats per minute, that's pretty typical to use an external pacemaker. You want to make sure the leads of the defibrillator machine is hooked up to the patient because you want the pacemaker to actually read the person's underlying rhythm because we don't want it to pace on the person's own beats. So this way it can read the person's own rhythm and only pace as it needs to. So there will be a pacing button, an on-off pacing button, a rate button where you can adjust the rate that you want, and then there will be one that says milliamps or current. And you will turn on the milliamps or the current button and you will start increasing it until you see a pacemaker spike and until you see capture happen. Now, and we'll explain what that looks like in just a minute. But this can take a lot of current because it's going externally through the body. It's having to go through muscle, through bone, through fat. And sometimes it can take anywhere between 40 to 80 milliamps of current on average to get capture to happen that's really uncomfortable for a person. And I took care of a really large man one time that it took 110 milliamps of current to get capture to happen. So this is something that's not tolerated well by the person. They will usually need a little bit of sedation and maybe even some pain medication to be able to tolerate this. Um, so external pacers are really just a temporary stopgap for you. So you have that patient who has that symptomatic bradycardia, they're in that third degree heart block and we're giving them atropine and it's not working or we've already maxed our dose of atropine out. This is another option until that you can come and do something more permanent, but this is only meant to be on them for a couple hours at most. Like I said, it's not tolerated well, it's really uncomfortable, it is not meant to be a permanent issue. So if the rhythm is still continuing, then they would probably they might consider a temporary pacemaker. 
Now this is known as a transvenous pacemaker because what's going to happen is the physician is going to thread a wire through the subclavian or through the internal jugular and they're going to thread it into the heart muscle. Then they'll put the other end of it and they will use these alligator clamps. They'll put the other end of the wire and tighten them down with these alligator clamps and they will pace with this box will send an electrical impulse down that wire and stimulate the heart to actually contract. Now, the other type of patient, um, sometimes our post-open heart surgery patients, the physicians will leave wires in their heart. They're called epicardial wires because they're going directly through the ep into the epicardium of the layer of the heart, and they'll be threaded out through the skin. And sometimes they're just kind of taped onto the chest till the doctor's ready to pull them out. But if your patient needed a pacemaker, you could actually just untape them and put the end of those wires into these alligator clamps and then turn your pacemaker on. So the on off button is right here. There is a rate button. And so again, usually around 70 beats per minute is a good place to start. And then the milliamps, you will turn the milliamps up until you actually see the pacemaker fire and until you see capture happen. Now, when I was talking about the external pacemaker, I told you 40 to 80 milliamps a current is pretty common because it's got to go through the muscle, the bone, and the fat. But with this, it usually only takes about 8 to 10 milliamps of current to get capture to happen because it's going direct, the wire is going directly into the heart muscle. It's actually, and it's so this electrical impulse is traveling down that wire and actually stimulating the heart muscle directly. So it takes a lot less current. Now a permanent pacemaker is where we're going to spend most of our time here. And with the permanent pacemaker, we're going to have a pulse generator. That's our battery. Okay, and it's usually a lithium battery, and these batteries last for quite a while. It, as far as how long a battery would last would really depend on how often the person's being paced. So if the person has a permanent pacemaker in and it's pacing 100% of the time, two, three years out of that battery might, might be all they get. Where if the person is just intermittently pacing, their own rhythm sometimes is fast enough, sometimes it slows down and the pacemaker has to kick in then you know they might get five or six years out of that battery. So we have a pulse generator. Then there's wires. So the wires are embedded. So the wires are usually tucked in. They go in through usually the subclavian vein and they're threaded in through the superior vena cava. And there might be one or two wires depending on what type of pacemaker they have. So if they have two wires, one will get embedded into the muscle, the atria, and one of them are gonna, is gonna get embedded down into the ventricle. So now what's going to happen is this electrical stimulus from the battery is going to come down this wire and it's going to trigger the heart to fire. Now you'll notice these little tines down here. Some of the wires have tines on them and some of them have kind of like a corkscrew kind of into it to embed into the heart muscle. I don't know if you remember from the first class when we were learning about um, the, the anatomy of the heart, but with the anatomy of the heart, we said even though the, it's smooth connective tissue in the, endo, in the inner, um, endocardium of the heart, the inner layer of the heart, there's all these valleys and ridges. So these tines kind of just embed into those valleys and ridges. Um, oh, and here's an example. Here's the tine lead, and then here's like the screw-in type of lead. So you'll notice here that um, we've got our pulse generator. We'll have a wire, one or two, depending on what they need. And then there's like a little grounding area right here where the impulse is going to stimulate and it's going to come back and ground itself. So the pacing generator, the pulse generator um, box, is actually embedded underneath the skin. Now, a lot of times they come in through the left side of the heart because of the anatomy, how it's just, it's, the wire tends to just curve and go down that superior vena cava a little bit easier, but I've seen them on the right side as well. They put this in the subcutaneous area, just a little pocket underneath the skin. So it's actually underneath the skin, but you can usually see it. You can usually see kind of a hard lump underneath the skin and you can usually, when you press on it, you can feel it. So, um... Well, that's pretty much about it out there. Um, the, the generators are much, much smaller than they used to be. I went to a class on pacemakers and the doctor that was teaching it, he had one of the original pacemakers in and it was probably about five inches in diameter and probably a full inch thick.
okay, was the with some of the original pacemakers. Now they're probably about the size of a 50 cent piece, and they're not much fatter than a 50 cent piece. So uh, maybe a little bit fatter, but not much. So they're they've come a long way, and they can do so much more than they used to be able to do. This is kind of what it looks like underneath the skin. So just kind of a hardened area underneath the skin. It's a little bit raised. And on x-rays, you will see it. It will light up on a chest x-ray as well. Now, how do you know what the pacemaker is supposed to do? So when you get a patient that is admitted to the hospital and they already have a pacemaker, when a person has a permanent pacemaker put in, we always tell the person, we give them a little card that has what their pacemaker is, how it's programmed, and they're supposed to always carry that with them. But you know how that works. I mean, how many times have we asked a patient, what meds are you on? Oh, a little pink pill, a little blue pill. You ask a person, well, what's your pacemaker? Is it a, a dual chamber pacemaker, a ventricular pacemaker? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it always amazes me how many times people don't know what they have inside their body. But these pacemaker codes tell you what the pacemaker is supposed to be doing. So the first letter of a pacemaker code is the chamber that is paced. So if the first letter is an A, that means you have a wire going into the atria. Okay. So if the first letter is an A, you have one wire from that pulse generator going into the atria and it's pacing the atria only. Okay. If you have a V as your first letter, that means you have one wire coming from your pulse generator and it's going into the ventricles and it's pacing the ventricles for you and that's all. If you have a D as your first letter, it's a dual pacemaker, meaning you have two wires coming off your pulse generator, one's embedded into the atria and one's embedded into the ventricles. You will not have a first letter of a zero. The second letter is the chamber that is sensed. That means it can read the person's underlying rhythm. It can see what the person's own heart is doing. So if your second letter is an A, that means it can see the person's atrial beats. So if the sinus node fires, if the atrial pathway fires, the pacemaker can see it, okay, and recognize what's happening. If it's a V, it can sense the ventricles. And if it's a D, it's dual. It can sense both atria and ventricles. Now, if you have a zero as your second letter, that means it cannot sense the person's own underlying rhythm. It's going to be programmed to go at a set rate and it's going to fire at that rate all the time and it's not even going to see what the person's own heart rate is doing. The third letter is the mode or response to that sensing. So, so it senses the person's underlying rhythm, but what's it going to do about it? If it has an I for the third letter, it means it's going to be inhibited. So if it sees, if it senses the person's own rhythm, it will inhibit the pacemaker from firing. If it has a T, it will be triggered by what it sees. And if it's a dual pacemaker, it can be inhibited or triggered depending on what it's sensing. If it has a zero as the third letter, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't it doesn't respond in any way to what it's what it's seeing. The fourth letter is is responsiveness. Some of the other things that can be done. So it used to be with pacemakers. When I first went into nursing and I first started taking care of patients with pacemakers, they were set. They had three letters to them. We had the chamber that it was going into, the chamber that it could sense, and then what it would do about that sensing. So let's say you needed a pacemaker. Let's say, or let's say your parent or your grandparent needed a pacemaker. They're 65 years old and for some reason their heart rate's really slow and they need a permanent pacemaker. So they put a pacemaker in the ventricles. So the pacemaker is going in the ventricles and it senses the person's underlying ventricular rhythm and it inhibits itself if it sees the person's own rhythm going in. And they set that pacemaker at a rate of 70. They don't ever want that person's heart rate to go less than 70. Well, if that person is dependent on that pacemaker, their own heart rate isn't really doing anything and they're pacing at 70 all the time and they're 65. And what if they're still active? What if they still like to go hiking? What if they still like to go jogging? What if they like to go rock climbing? What was happening is these people were having pacemakers put in and they were tired all the time because their pacemaker was set at 70, which is great for a resting heart rate. But when you're active, your heart rate goes up. So they started making pacemakers be rate responsive. So what a rate responsive pacemaker will do for you 
is it will speed up. You'll have a low limit. So let's say your low limit is set at 70. So if your heart rate goes below 70, your pacemaker is going to kick in. It's going to keep you at least at a minimum of 70. But if you're active, so they have these movement sensors built into them. And if you're active, it will see movement. And so it sees that you're rock climbing. It sees that you're jogging. It's going to speed up. So it may be set at a rate of 70 and maybe a rate of one tenth. Okay. And so when you're exercising or you're active, your heart rate is going, your pacemaker will speed up for you to actually give you more. Okay. Just like your own heart rate normally does. If it's P, it's a programmable pacemaker. And if it's M, it's a multi-programmable pacemaker. And now, of course, they also make defibrillating pacemakers as well, where if a person goes into VTAC or um, VFib, you know, suddenly it will um, automatically defibrillate them. So common pacemaker codes. The two most common pacemaker codes you will ever see is a DDD and a VVI. So a DDD pacemaker means you're going to have two wires, one into the atria, one into the ventricles. It's going to pace both atria and ventricles. The second D, it will sense what the atria is doing. It will sense what the ventricles are doing. The third D, it will inhibit or trigger itself by what it's seeing. This pacemaker is the most common type of pacemaker because it's going to most clearly mimic normal cardiac function. It's going to let your atria and your ventricles work in sync. It's going to make sure both of them are firing like they should. A VVI pacemaker is only has one wire. It's going to pace the ventricles only. It will sense what the ventricles are doing. And if the person's own ventricles kick in, it will inhibit itself so it will not deliver the impulse when the person's own ventricles are going. Now, why would anybody want a VVI pacemaker over a DDD pacemaker? I mean, DDD mimics cardiac function. Your atria and your ventricles work in sync. If you only have one, one wire going into the heart, it's only pacing the ventricles. That's not normal cardiac function. Normally, your atria and ventricles work in sync. But if you think about this, okay, a very common rhythm to see on a cardiac floor is atrial fibrillation. And a lot of patients have lived with atrial fib for years. I mean, they've been in atrial fib for years and years and years. And now all of a sudden they need a pacemaker. There is a good chance they have clot formation going on in their atria. And if we put in a DDD pacemaker, that first time those atria contract in response to it, if there's clots there, they're just going to shower clots everywhere. So it is not unusual if, they're, if they have a hit long history of atrial fib and now they need a pacemaker to just get a VVI pacemaker. So there are basic functions of our pacemakers. They have to be able to fire, they have to be able to capture, and they have to be able to sense. Okay, So those are the things that our pacemaker has to do for us. So what it means by firing is that pulse generator, the battery that's implanted underneath the skin, is going to fire a preset amount of electricity and it's going to send that preset amount of electricity down that wire that's been embedded into the heart and it's going to cause it's basically going to take the place of the automatic the automaticity of the heart so normally your SA node would normally fire um, so since it's not your pacemaker is going to do it for you it'll take this preset amount of electricity and start the initiation of the conduction system so um, when it does that, when it fires, it's going to make us a, a mark on the ECG paper. Firing will look like just like a hash mark. It'll look like kind of a hash mark coming down on the ECG paper when it fires. Then our pacemaker has to capture. And what capturing means, or actually our heart has to capture in response to that firing. So capturing means the heart's responded to that stimulus. You've sent that electrical impulse down into the, through the wire into the heart muscle, causing the fire, and then it has to respond to it. So the heart actually has to cause, have depolarization happen. That electrical stimulus has to travel through the heart to actually spread the message throughout the heart. Now think about this. If your heart normally, when the impulse starts in the SA node, it normally goes through the intranodal, intraatrial pathways, and then down the ventricular pathways. But if our pacing wire is actually embedded, say, in the ventricles, 
It's not going through the normal pathways. It has to go through cell to cell conduction and that takes longer. So our on our ECG paper, if it's ventricular depolarization that's capturing, it's going to look like a wide funky QRS. And if we have atrial depolarization, if because we have a wire going in the atria, we would have an atypical or abnormal looking P wave. So what you're looking at here, so here I see a pacemaker spike right here and then a wide QRS. Pacemaker spike, wide QRS. Pacemaker spike, wide QRS. Pacemaker spike, wide QRS. Now this person happens to have their own P wave, but that may not always be the case in a ventricular pacemaker. This is a, so, so this one here, you see these, pay, the, this means it's firing, this, pay, this hash, big hash mark, a wide funky QRS responding to it means it's capturing, that it was enough energy to cause depolarization and it happened. If we have a pacemaker spike in the atria, we will have a pacemaker spike and a atypical or a funky looking P wave. It may not always be upside down like this particular example is, but you'll see a pacemaker spike and an atypical P wave. Pacemaker spike, atypical P wave. The other thing that our pacemaker, we said we'll do for it, is it has to sense. It, it, it's going to sense that the pulse generator, it, sensing means our pulse generator can see the person's own underlying heartbeat. It can see that intrinsic beat of the person and fire only when the patient's own heart rate slows down. So if I look at this, I see a pacemaker spike. I see this big hash mark and a wide funky QRS. Pacemaker spike wide funky QRS. Now this must only be a ventricular pacemaker because if it was a DDD pacemaker, I should have had a pacemaker spike and a P wave as well. Okay, so this one's just a ventricular pacemaker. Well, here their own beat kicked in, their own heartbeat fired. Okay, so the pacemaker sees it, it senses the person's own heart rhythm and it's it inhibits that pacemaker from firing. It keeps the pacemaker from firing. So if our pacemaker is set at a rate of 70 and it should have fired here, but it sees this, this rate went in, it's, it doesn't fire. And then it, it waits and it waits and it's like, okay, their own heart rate should have kicked back in again, but it didn't. So then it starts firing again. So what that does by it being able to see the person's own heart rhythm and keep the pacemaker from firing, that's going to save your battery a lot longer. Okay, it's going to keep the heartbeats from competing against each other and it'll save that battery for us. So our pacemakers have to have firing, capturing, and sensing abilities. Now our pacemakers also are going to have intervals. So remember with our regular heart, we have PR intervals, we have QRS intervals. Well, with the pacemaker, we're going to have what's called an automatic interval. And this is the amount of time occurring between the paced beats, between the paced beats. So let's say my pacemaker is set to go at a rate of 70. Okay, my pacemaker is set to go at a rate of 70. So my pacemaker fires, big, wide, funky QRS. Pacemaker fires, big, wide, funky QRS. Pacemaker fires, big, wide, funky QRS. This here is only a ventricular pacemaker. And I can tell that because if it was a dual pacemaker, I would have a pacemaker spike and a P wave, a pacemaker spike and a QRS. Either their own P wave would have been here or a, or a paced P wave would have been here. But because there's only a pacemaker and a QRS, there's no P wave, not their own P wave or a paced P wave. I know this is only a ventricular pacemaker. But if this pacemaker was set to go at 70, it's going to fire at a rate of 70 all the way across. And it's going to keep firing in that paced rhythm at a rate of 70 until their own beat kicks in. And then it will pause that pacemaker for that. Now, an escape interval is a little bit different. So what an escape interval is. So if I look at this strip right here, it looks like my underlying rhythm is AFib. I have an irregular R to R and no clear distinct P waves. I see that here and I see that here. Irregular R to R and no clear distinct P waves. So it looks like my underlying rhythm is atrial fib. So if I have a pacemaker that is set to fire at a rate of 70, what, what the pacemaker does is it's like, okay, here's, here's the person's own beat. And a rate of 70 would have been about right here. 
okay? But instead of that pacemaker firing right there, it gives it just a little bit longer to see if their own beat will kick back in. And if it doesn't, so their own beat didn't kick in, then the pacemaker's like, hey, I was, I was giving it just a little, I know I'm supposed to fire at a rate of 70, but I'm going to give it just a little bit longer to see if their own beat will kick in. If it doesn't, so that's my escape interval. If it doesn't, I'm going to start kicking in, and now I'm going to fire at my automatic interval of my rate of whatever it is, 70, 80, whatever the doctor has set it for. So here I've got a pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS. So VVI pacemaker, it paces the ventricles, it senses the pacemaker, or it senses the ventricles, it will inhibit it, the pacer if it sees the person's own rhythm. So here I have the person's own P waves there, but their pacemaker, but their QRS doesn't kick in, so the pacemaker fires wide QRS. Their own P wave fires, but their own QRS responded to it. So the pacemaker, again, this pacemaker is only reading the ventricles. It sees the ventricles, sees their own beat kicked in, keeps the pacemaker from firing. Then their P wave went again, but that QRS didn't follow it. And so the pacemaker waits a little bit, not firing. Pacemaker fires wide funky QRS. Pacemaker fires wide funky QRS. Now, a dual pacemaker, we said, will have two wires to it, one into the atria, one into the ventricles. It will sense both the atria and the ventricles. It will inhibit itself or trigger itself, depending on what it's seeing. So, with a DDD pacemaker, it can get a little confusing because I have a pacemaker spike. Oh, I'm sorry, I have my person's own P wave. My person's own P wave is right there. And then their own QRS came in. So that's their own beat. So the pacemaker saw it, saw the P wave, saw the QRS, inhibited itself. So now it's looking for their own beat and it's not kicking in. So the pacemaker fires and I get a funky P wave, fires again, I get the funky QRS. Now it goes again, their own beat didn't kick in. So here it saw their own beats, so it inhibited the pacemaker from firing. Here it saw that there isn't their own beats, so it triggered the pacemaker to go. So pacemaker fired, wide funky, or uh, atypical, unusual P wave, but then their own QRS responded to it. So even though the pacemaker had to fire for the atria, their own ventricles got the message from that atrial beat and fired, so the ventricles were inhibited here. So this is normal. So this can be normal where a DDD pacemaker may fire for the atria and fire for the ventricles, or it may just fire for the atria and their own ventricles will respond to it. Here, the person's own P wave fired, their own P wave fired, but their QRS didn't respond to it, so now the pacemaker kicked in for just the QRS. So it can get really confusing to look at a DDD pacemaker because you may see pacemaker spike and a P wave, pacemaker spike and a QRS, pacemaker spike and just the P wave and you'll get their own QRS or your own P wave and just a pacemaker spike and the ventricles or their own beat. And all of that is normal for a DDD pacemaker. The pacemaker is only going to do the component that's missing for that patient. So here's another example of with a DDD pacemaker. I have a pacemaker spike and, a, and an atypical P wave, pacemaker spike and a wide QRS, pacemaker spike and an atypical P wave, pacemaker spike and a wide QRS. Then their own beat kicked in, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. Then their own P wave kicked in, but their ventricles didn't respond, so the pacemaker fired for the ventricles. Their own P wave kicked in, but ventricles didn't, so it fired for the ventricles, P wave or um, pacemaker fired, atypical P wave, pacemaker fired, and my QRS responded to it. So that is all normal in a DDD pacemaker. So if we look at this one here, so in this paste rhythm, okay, I mean, again, you can see once I go into a paste rhythm, it's going to have that automatic interval, R to R to R should be regular. My rate here is one, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like my rate's probably set at 70. 
I see that I don't have a P wave. I don't see a sinus P wave, but I see this hash mark here, and that's telling me I've got a paste beat right here. So I see this paste hash mark here and a wide funky QRS. Paste beat or a paste hash mark and a wide funky QRS. So this one here would be a ventricular pacemaker only. Because if it was a DDD pacemaker, it's not working because I don't have any P waves at all, not paced or normal. Okay, so this is a ventricular pace rhythm only. Now this one here, I see a hash mark and wide funky QRS, hash mark, wide funky QRS, hash mark, wide funky QRS. Now this looks like I have kind of a fibrillatory baseline. So my I'm thinking that my patient was probably an AFib originally before they got into this uh, paste rhythm, but it looks like it's just a ventricular pacemaker. Now this one here, I see that I have a hash mark and a P wave, hash mark and a QRS, hash mark P wave, hash mark QRS, all the way across my strip. So this one would be a dual pacemaker, and I know this because I have a paste P wave and a paste ventricular B. And this one, again, this is going to most cl closely mimic normal cardiac function because it's going to make your atria and your ventricles work in sync just like they normally should. Now, this one here, I have their own P wave, their own QRS, their own P wave, their own QRS, their own P wave, their own QRS. And then I see their own P wave, but their own QRS didn't kick into it. So now I have a paste, a little hash mark, Q wide funky QRS, hash mark, wide funky QRS hash mark, wide funky QRS. Now, even though I haven't seen the pacemaker kick in for the P wave, it can still be a DDD pacemaker because it's seeing their own P wave. It's actually seeing and sensing their own P wave. So this can still be normal for a DDD pacemaker. Here is um, a 12 lead with a person who has a pace rhythm. And the reason I wanted to show you this is you will, sometimes it's really hard to see your hash marks. I mean, sometimes your hash marks aren't really big and obvious. Like some leads, like over here, you see the hash marks really big. And in some leads, it's really tiny and you'd really be struggling to tell that they even have one. So if you know the person has a pacemaker and you're having a hard time seeing your pacemaker spike, sometimes you just need to move your leads around. Um, sometimes instead of being in a perfectly two, I'll just move it over a little bit. Or if, if I'm doing MCL, for instance, I mean, normally the positive electrodes in that fourth intercostal space to the right of the sternal border, I may move it down or up a little bit. Sometimes it'll pick the pacemaker spike up a little bit easier for you. Um, so here again is a dual chamber pacemaker. I have a pacemaker spike and a little tiny P wave is what it's trying to tell me. Uh, pacemaker spike, QRS, pacemaker spike, a little tiny P wave. It's a pretty tiny P wave, but he, this is showing it to you in lead two, and this is showing it to you in MCL, and you can see the P wave a little bit better here. So here I see my pacemaker spike and my P wave, pacemaker spike, and a wide funky QRS. Now here I see my pacemaker spikes better, but here I see my P wave better. And that's one nice thing about the five lead systems that we usually monitor our patients in now. You know, it, it, Again, seeing things in different leads, some of them you can pick your pacemaker spikes up better, some of them you can pick your waveforms up a little bit better. Now, what a fusion beat is, is a fusion beat occurs when the pacemaker fires an electrical stimulus at the same time their own beat kicked in. So here is, now this person just has a ventricular pacemaker, pacemaker spike, YQRS, pacemaker spike, Y, QRS, and then their own little rhythm came in. They got their P wave, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, and here the P goes. And right as their own QRS starts to go, the pacemaker fires. So what happens is it becomes a blend of the paste beat and their own QRS. They blend together. It's called a fusion beat. And I know it sounds like it would be really dangerous, but actually they say they're usually not dangerous. It's just, it's a waste of the pacemaker. If, it's, if it happens very rarely, they don't usually worry about it. But if it's happening a lot, they'll usually readjust the pacemaker settings a little bit so it'll kick in just a little bit later so there's not as many fusion beats because that's just wasting the battery. That's saying their own ventricles were ready to fire, but it just, you know, but the pacemaker is happening at the same time. So it's a beat that looks kind of a cross between the pace beat and their own beat. And that's just called a fusion beat. Now there are some malfunctions that can happen with pacemakers. 
and that's never pleasant. So one of them is loss of firing. So that means the pacemaker fails to deliver an adequate stimulus to pace the heart. So it's seen on the ECG paper as a disappearance of the pacemaker spike even when the patient's own heart rate is too slow or too absent. So here it looks like I have a pacemaker spike and a wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS. Now the person's own P waves are happening, but there's no ventricular response. And that pacemaker, if it was set to fire at a minimum of a rate of 70, that pacemaker should have been kicking in here. So that means that that pacemaker, that generator box, is not sending an impulse down. So it may be from a, malf a malfunction in the generator, or a low or dead battery, or a fracture of the pacing wire, the pacing wire that's going from the box to the patient's heart. Maybe it's broken or it's become disconnected in some way. So we're going to do supportive care. We're basically going to treat this like a person who's having a huge pause, right? If they're dizzy, if they're lightheaded, we could try atropine. We may even need to use an external pacemaker until that doctor can come in and replace, and get them down to the cath lab and replace that battery for that patient or fix the wire if necessary. Another type of malfunction is called loss of capture, and that's when the pacemaker fires, but it's not enough stimulus to cause depolarization of the heart muscle. So you get this pacemaker spike, but there's no P wave after it or no QRS after it. Okay, so you get a pacemaker spike, but the but the waveform doesn't follow it because it's not depolarizing. And that may be because the the wire, the catheter tip of that wire has come disconnected out of the muscle and it's just kind of floating around in the heart. Or it can be if the person had a heart attack and now they've had damage to the myocardial cells right there, you know, that impulse that is normally strong enough to cause depolarization, if that heart muscle has been damaged there, it may not respond to that stimulus anymore. So again, supportive care. We need to call the physician. Um, we can try turning the patient on their side. Because if we turn the patient on their left side, what that does is if that pacing wire is kind of floating around in the heart, if you turn them to their left side, it floats up against the wall of the ventricles, and sometimes it may cause the stimulus to capture. So loss of capture, what's going to happen is you're going to see a pacemaker spike, but you're not going to see the waveform that comes after it. So if it's a ventricular pacemaker, you're going to see... You, you would see the pacemaker spike, but no wide funky QRS like what I've got here. Here I have a pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS. Here the pacemaker fired, but it didn't capture. Again, we need to report this to the physician. There's something going on with that pacemaker and we don't want it to get worse. Okay. Another malfunction. I mean, again, we said pacemakers have to fire, they have to capture and they have to sense. So the next malfunction is the problem with the sensing. So this occurs when the pulse generator doesn't see the person's own underlying rhythm anymore. And so that can be reflected by pacing spikes that occur earlier or on the QRS or on the downslope of the T wave. And remember, that's our vulnerable period. So if the pacemaker isn't seeing the person's underlying rhythm anymore and it's, you know, and it's firing when the person's own own you know, after their own heartbeats fired and we're hitting that downslope of the T wave, that could potentially be dangerous. And this can happen from, again, the pacemaker tip being displaced or a malfunction in the generator or the wire itself has become broken in some way. And you know what, if they go, if they start having PVCs or start having VTAC or something like that, because it's causing this to happen, you know, we might need to do antiarrhythmics to try to suppress that some. But here I have a pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS. And now their own QRS popped up there. But now the pacemaker spike didn't even didn't even see it. Didn't even see it. So the pacemaker spike fired. Now the heart didn't capture in response to it because it was it was probably still depolarizing here. Their own beat kicked in again and now it pacemaker spike, YQRS. So the pacemaker didn't even see this happening right here. And again, if that hits on that downslope of the T wave, that can be potentially problematic for our patient. So again, something we need to notify the physician of. 
So this is what a, a person might look like if they were a systolic and they had a pacemaker. So let's say the person um, goes into asystole, which is normally a flat line, but if they had a permanent pacemaker, they still might be having pacemaker spikes, no capture happening. This is exactly the same as asystole, okay? There's nothing beating in that heart, even though they're still pacing, the pacemaker generator still firing. Um, so here I see a pacemaker spike, wide funky QRS, pacemaker spike, P wave, then their own QRS, pacemaker spike, and I didn't really see anything happen right there, but then their own P and their own QRS kicked in. Here a P wave happened and no QRS, so a pacemaker spike and a QRS. So it's not really quite reading the person's underlying rhythm quite correctly. And so they're usually, usually they just have to take them in and, and sometimes just readjust sensitivity to it. Sometimes just recheck all the placement of everything. All right. And we are going.